Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this uh, important discussion. Uh, you know, I think it's really instructive and somewhat ironic, given that it's the Justice Scalia vacancy, uh, to hear all of these arguments from the left that the Constitution requires, demands a hearing and a vote in a certain time frame. Most folks on the left, most outside groups, many centers on the left are clearly making that argument. And I think it's sort of ironic, given that we're debating a vacancy created by Justice Scalia's death, because Justice Scalia taught us first and foremost, read the words. Words have meaning, read the words. Don't just make it up as you go along. Don't use these vague tools like legislative history to just get to whatever end you want to get to. And I think it's instructive because um, the left wants a new Supreme Court justice who's going to not read the words, who is going to make it up as they go along and get to a preordained stopping point, um, however they can get there. Uh, but again, words matter and the Constitution and the other relevant words, in this case the Senate rules, are clear and they don't require a hearing and they don't require action on any particular time frame. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the Constitution says simply in Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, the President shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and counsels, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for and which shall be established by law. That's what it says, pure and simple. Doesn't talk about any time frame, doesn't talk about any required action. And the other text which governs are the Senate rules. Constitution makes very clear the Senate can establish rules to follow within the bounds of the Constitution. And the Senate rules, the only thing they have to say about the timing of action is when a vote won't occur. Uh, it shall not be put on the same day on which the nomination is received, nor on the day on which it may be reported by a committee, unless by unanimous consent. That's Senate Rule 31.1. And then there's 31.6, which is very relevant and instructive, instructive. Nominations neither confirmed nor rejected during the session at which they are made shall not be acted upon at any succeeding session without being again made to the Senate by the President, close quote. So that makes explicit that no hearing or action is required during that session. Now, everybody here has voted for those rules. Um, I, I don't know why folks taking a contrary view in the minority didn't change that rule, didn't vote no to that rule, or aren't proposing a change to that rule now. Everybody here voted for that rule. And again, um, these arguments somehow that the Constitution requires us to act in a certain way or a certain time frame just isn't true. And in honor of Justice Scalia, I do think we need to read the words first and foremost. And again, I think it's instructive because that's really what this debate is all about. Are we going to have a new justice who reads the words and applies them as written? Or are we going to have a justice who helps make it up as he or she goes along, who legislates from the bench, who tries to get to a certain endpoint using whatever vague arguments uh, are at his or her disposal. And of course, as has been said clearly, uh, so many leading members on the other side have confirmed this in the past when they were in a different position. Senator Reid, uh, Senator Schumer. Senator Schumer went a lot further back than we are now. He said 18 months before the end of the Bush presidency, no Supreme Court justice should be confirmed except under extraordinary circumstances. 
I'm happy to live by the Schumer rule. Um, this is not an extraordinary circumstance with an election mm -hmm. coming up. I would uh, defer uh, to the people. And so the question is, what's the right thing to do moving forward? I'm very comfortable uh, with deferring to the people, empowering citizens, putting them in charge. That's certainly what my constituents want in Louisiana. They're crying out in frustration of their not being in charge of Washington, regularly ignoring their wishes of this trend of courts legislating from the bench and making it up as they go along, continuing. They want a voice in this, and they want a voice to be able to stop that. So I defer to the people. We have a unique opportunity to do that with this very important president, presidential election before us. I often think in virtually every presidential election that the most important issue in the election, which gets little or no attention, is Supreme Court appointments, because that has impact for decades to come. We have an opportunity this year where that won't be the case, um, where hopefully it will be front and center. We'll have an important debate about the proper role of the Supreme Court, about the proper way for judges to make the decisions, namely to read and apply the law as written. And certainly my constituents in Louisiana want that. They want to have a leading voice. They want to be in charge. The great majority of them strongly object to the trend of nine or really five unelected lawyers making huge decisions for society which are not in and are not mandated by the Constitution. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your leadership. I strongly support uh, the path moving forward that we've uh, adopted, and uh, I vote for putting the people and, and citizens in charge through the presidential election. I think it's an important and a somewhat unique opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.